This is the 13th and final video in the Test First Development Series. And in this video, I'm going to get up on my soapbox. Here it is. There's my soapbox. And if you look inside, you can even see I've, I've got a little soap. OK, so what do I mean? What am I going to soapbox about? Really, I just want to do a little bit of analysis. And I want to start by addressing some contrary opinions. So many of you probably know who Jonathan Blow is. He is a giant in the industry. Um, he's written more code and more complex code and more code that's in active production today than, than I could ever hope to do. He's, he's an incredible contributor to the whole world of software engineering, the world we live and work in. So I respect this guy a lot. And he's got a YouTube video, which I'm going to link below, where he really rips in to test first development um, and uh, gets a little personal at times, but he's got some great points. And I feel like we should address them. We should listen to what he has to say. And then in my own way, I get to comment a little bit, but we got to take these things seriously. So. I've excerpted some quotes that I can read to you, and then I'm also going to try to link some clips so you can go listen to the specific clips if you want to. Okay, so here's the first one that I found. So Jonathan said, this whole thing about TDD, about writing the tests before you write the code is nonsense because you don't exactly know what you're building yet. And if you're, do, if you're doing anything in, interesting, sorry, I, I mangled that a little. You don't know what you're building yet if you're doing anything interesting. So he's got a great point here. If, if you're in early prototyping or you've got some new and kind of not well understood software engineering problem and you're doing exploratory coding and you're not even really sure how it's gonna go, it would absolutely be a silly waste of time to try to write unit tests at that point and try to write your tests first. I, I completely agree. Um, the point that I would make is that unit tests work well when the domain is well understood. So um, a lot of the projects that I work on and that you perhaps work on as a C-sharp developer, which is really, it can do all kinds of things and people do build games with it, but most of the C-sharp code in the world is uh, running business applications. And in those situations, there are business rules that you can articulate. Now in the agile terminology, you might call them user stories. I'm a little old fashioned. We talked about specifications and business rules, but it's possible to write a set of rules such as there's a maximum number of, of uh, you know, order, uh, items in an order, just things like that. And so if the problem you're working on can be um, broken down to clearly articulated rules, then, well, then you've got a good surface for writing unit tests. And then I think the idea of writing the unit test first as part of the rule discovery process and then implementing it works really, really well. But um, totally, totally agree with Jonathan that there are situations where it's way too early to attempt to write any sorts of tests. Okay, the next thing he said is, you're multiplying the amount of code tremendously, which increases the cost of your project. Well, yes and no. I mean, I agree, you're writing more code, that takes more time. However, if it improves your code quality, and if you release your product with fewer bugs, then it actually decreases the total cost of the project. Because fixing, you know, people talk about the cost of fixing a bug. Well, if you can fix it at design time when you're specking the project out and understanding the requirements, that's the cheapest way to do it of all. And if you can find it during the kind of code and code review process before you've released it, that's very efficient. Once a bug has been released into the wild, the, the cost of the bug in terms of both fixing it, you know, finding it, documenting it, deploying the fix, goes way up. And also there's the sort of intangible costs about uh, associated with releasing buggy software. So 
I actually feel like when it's done right and appropriately, test-first development decreases the costs of projects. It, it, it increases the out-of-the-box code quality in a way that, that makes it more efficient and that it is worth the upfront investment, which I acknowledge, yes, you do have to do a little more work upfront to write the tests, but the payoff is, is pretty good in my view. Okay, the next thing he said is, one of the things you find in complex systems like games is that bugs are not isolated to units usually. They happen in the more complicated parts of the code, which is where things come together, and it's not really unitizable. Well, that is absolutely true. Um, sometimes people call it system integration bugs, or you know, what happens when you take all the pieces of a complex system and you finally put them together and you let them play? And especially if it's like a real-time system where they're very complex, rapid interactions. So I completely agree. There are um, all kinds of bugs that you can't catch with unit tests, and they have to do with the integration and, and, and of, of a complex system. However, I would argue that wouldn't you rather be chasing down those integration and complexity and timing related bugs? Wouldn't you rather chase them down knowing that at least the components themselves are solid? Like the components that are talking to each other and interacting badly, at least internally, they are correct, coherent, and performant on their own. That's a really good place to start, at least. Otherwise, when you're chasing down those complicated interaction bugs, you might actually discover that what you had is really just a misbehaving component. So um, the, you know, the corollary to this is that unit testing doesn't find all bugs, absolutely. And, and unit testing and test-first development does find one class of bugs in certain kinds of systems there's a bunch of other bugs. GUI bugs are a big one where you really just need to, you know, do some automated GUI testing. And there, there are tools and techniques for testing um, those other and looking for those other kinds of bugs. So I agree with caveat. Um, it doesn't mean that unit testing is useless. It just means that you have to understand what it's good for. All right. The next thing he said is, I think there are more efficient, better ways to test that capture more bugs, and you want to do those things. Well, I think I already addressed this. Yes, unit testing is one kind of testing. It has its place. It doesn't do everything. Agreed. Number five, the more code you have, the less agile you are. And unit tests add a great deal of code. So changing things, it's like tar. It's keeping you stuck. So. I understand the, this feeling. Like I just had a project where I had to go back and add something to it. And it took discipline. It, it, there was like an activation energy. I had to get over the hump and realize, don't just go in and add that feature. You know, Go in and add the unit test for the feature. You're changing something, but you really should keep the test library up to date. It's, it's hard to do, and sometimes you do feel like, oh my gosh, this would have just been faster if I could have just coded it. Um, so yes, there is a cost, an ongoing cost, especially as the feature set and the requirements changes to maintaining the test library. But as I think I showed in video number 12, there are situations, for example, the main one is refactoring, where having a library of unit tests gives you the courage to just refactor the heck out of something and just run the test and know that you haven't broken anything. So those are situations where actually unit testing, I think, opens the door to change. You're not so paralyzed. You're not so afraid that because this system is so interlocked and complicated that if I change something, I might break something that I don't understand. All right. So those are Jonathan Blow's comments. I actually wrote a few down, a few critiques of my own down, things that you might be wondering. One question is, well, what happens if you write bad tests? Should you test your tests? And you know, this is the nightmare scenario, right? The tests for the tests and the tests for the tests for the tests. This is like the old factory, 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 factory method. And I guess my, 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 <laughs> the way I would address that is to say, yeah, tests are code. 
And there is no substitute for knowing how to write good code, for being good at what you do. Um, I've got a whole set of other videos about C-sharp language features I think you ought to know about, which I think will make you a better C-sharp programmer if you don't already know them. So you got to work on your craft. You have to be good at what you do, and you have to give proper attention not only to production code, but to test code. And if you write junky slapdash tests or bug-ridden tests, yeah, then they're useless. And you really haven't added a lot of value. You've, you've created a bunch of code, you've created a bunch of overhead, and you haven't achieved your goal. Um, so just like any code, writing good tests takes a little practice. And if you do it more, I think the quality of your tests will get better. And the last thing is, is this real? Like, do people actually do this? Or is this whole test-driven development thing just some academic exercise that sounds really good on paper, but it's you know not really for the real world? So all I can tell you is, in the last year or so, I've completed four projects. I'm currently working um, in a consulting firm. And we've completed four client projects. And in three of the four, they are fully unit tested. And it's true, the m amount of code in terms of lines of code that is in the tests for those three projects um, is a lot. It's actually more than the production code. At the same time, those projects, I just have amazing confidence that, that they're absolutely working, that they don't have any problem. And, the, and these are you know, important applications that we got paid a fair amount of money to build. So I like knowing that when I handed over that product, um, I didn't have a hunch that it was gonna work. I, I knew it, I, I had proved that it could work. And now that fourth project was a legacy system that is just way too far advanced and mature and complicated and, and in many ways brittle in order for us to be able to really apply any unit testing. So we didn't. But the, the short answer is yes, this is real, I use it, um, and I think you should consider it too. So by way of, of just wrapping up there, a few of those soapbox ideas. First, understand when test-driven or test-first development is gonna help you. There are certain kinds of programming tasks and situations where it's not appropriate, but learn to spot the ones where it's got value. And then understand, to understand what kind of bugs it can uncover and what kind of bugs that it can't. And make sure that you are doing those other kinds of testing as well. And if you've got a limited budget in your project, you might have to make some trade-offs. You know, you can't d always do everything. Um, and last, if you do decide to use test-driven development or test-first development, I would just suggest that you really kind of commit to it, not with blind religious zeal, but Basically, basically just with an understanding that as with, with any discipline or technique, they tend only to yield good results when you really apply it. So it, it does take a bit of commitment. Okay, there's my soapbox. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed the videos and I hope you'll give it a try. Please uh, comment, like the videos, share them, send me messages. I would love to get your feedback and uh, I wish you all well in your programming adventures.